Andrew Strong, how are you feeling today? Doing great, Derek. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for joining this live production of the Data Binge podcast. Uh, glad that you can come on and have a, an awesome discussion today. Happy to be here. I've been uh, following the Data Binge podcast since uh, we were in school together, so uh, honored to be one of your guests. Yeah, well, thanks for that. And uh, so i got to sh share this quick story about us and, and the way that I kind of know you. So you referenced school. So class of 2017, we both went to University of Texas, Macomb School of Business in Austin. And the school full-time program, so the school's broken up into, the class is broken up into cohorts. We were in cohort one, if I remember correctly. Yep. And you were sitting right below me, like in this kind of amphitheater type room, like 80 people in the room. And we yep. were taking this, one of the classes, corporate finance, and I was getting crushed by corporate finance. And you were like, essentially into perpetuity across the entire semester on MBA.com or on ESPN.com. <laughs> I could see your like screen flipped open, like not a worry in the world. And it was hilarious this one time, I was like stressing out, we were doing this simulation and I guess you had to buy stock or trade stock. And the winner of the simulation was you you shorted all this stock, yet you were never in class, like you're never paying attention, but you won this simulation. And the professor was like, Andrew Strong, you win, where is he? And like, they all like, everyone like looks over at your seat and your, your NBA.com screen is up, your, your name tag is there, you're nowhere to be found. And then like 10 minutes later, when the class is silent, you like burst open and the whole class like busts up laughing. So. That's what I think about when I think about you. <laughs> well, thanks. I don't know how uh, flattering that story is, but I, I, I think the moral is better to be lucky than good when you're investing in the market. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you're, you're, you're uh, have a great personality, one of the smartest people I know, and that's why I'm really excited to get on this, uh, this call with you. Yeah. So, so w what are you up to today, Andrew? Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we obviously graduated together in 2017. Um, when I went to business school, my, my main goal was to find a really exciting startup that I could join kind of at an early stage. Um, so shortly before I graduated, I got connected with a company called Correlation One. Um, and what Correlation One is, is we are a technology startup based in New York City. Um, and our whole mission is to help organizations build better data science and analytics teams. You know, we are obviously huge believers in the power of data and analytics to transform you know, the nature of work across all industries. Um, but most organizations need help kind of building teams with the right skills, with the right mix of people. And so we work with organizations from hedge funds to tech companies to insurance firms, uh, you know, even some nonprofits um, to help them, you know, build better um, kind of data and analytics professionals. Um, and then we also work with kind of professionals and students to help them, you know, build the skills and tools they need to progress in their career. It's it. I several times that we connected across you know the course of the several semesters that we shared together in school, yeah. and you were really focused on sustainability. You were focused on clean tech. I was too. It seems like you've always had this kind of passion to do something that's good for the world and and truly you know socially impactful. Like what what typically gives you energy behind some of these things that you're that you're doing. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, you know, I think that um, it's it's hard not to, you know, identify kind of mission driven aspects in whatever work you do. You obviously are, are very mission driven in the work that you're doing at Microsoft. Um, and I think, you know, our mission statement at Correlation One uh, is data science for all. You know, mm -hmm. we think data science, you know, as I said, is going to just be one of the largest economic forces in history. We also think it has the potential to be one of the most disruptive forces, you know, in, in potentially negative ways as well. And, mm -hmm. and so a big part of what we do is making sure that the transition to a more data driven economy is an equitable transition. And that, you know, takes a number of different forms. You know, it could mean that making sure that uh, data science organizations are composed of diverse and representative groups of people who can kind of uh, produce and kind of share and, and the work output that these organizations are contributing. You know, it also means that as data driven algorithms become more present in our society, those algorithms themselves need to be fair and unbiased and, and uh, transparent. Um, and so there's just a lot of work that's 
you know, important that needs to be done kind of as we make this transition um, and kind of making the data science uh, economy one that uh, benefits everybody. So, and then we, when we talked, just kind of preparing for this discussion, you were talking a lot about like this idea of data literacy and this idea yeah. of, of, you know, a lot of organization, like everything that we're doing and we kind of described, you know, product development, product design, um, HR is now becoming HR analytics. So there's yeah. all these different business units that are really outcrops of kind of the future of what data is making them. Like, how do you see that changing? Like, is it changing yeah. fast? What, what's that look like? No, I mean, I just think, um, you know, what we are seeing is that data science is permeating the economy on a number of different vectors. It's, you know, from an industry perspective, first it was the tech companies and the finance companies that were using data science. Now it's mm. logistics and e-commerce and insurance companies and operations companies. Every company is becoming a data company. So that's mm -hmm. that's one vector that kind of, you know, this field is growing. But another vector, as you mentioned, is just the roles themselves and the nature of work that people are, are responsible for is inevitably becoming more data driven. Um, you know, people analytics didn't exist 10 years ago, right? You had HR professionals who were, um, you know, kind of the people uh, focused uh, group in the organization, but kind of introducing analytics functions within those types of works is, is increasingly happening. Um, you know, marketing is obviously, you know, increasingly data driven, um, HR operations, you know, supply chain logistics. Sales. Um, we, sales, yeah, absolutely. Um, and we just see that uh, becoming more and more uh, of a trend. Um, and the implication there is that more and more people will need data skills. You know, being a sales professional, it's no longer just around glad handing people and, and kind of being personable and being, you know, like a, a good salesman. Um, you need to know Salesforce and know the power of Salesforce and, and other CRM tools and, you know, leveraging analytics to, to, to make yourself more successful. And when you think about, so you're in this position, uh, Correlation One is doing a lot of work with kind of changing the way that businesses and organizations um, develop and train these individuals, hire them. Um, when you think about that process, like what is changing about that process or that, ne that needs to change about that process that really is, is exciting to you and the rest of your leadership team? Yeah. That, that's a good question. Um, and, and there's a couple things there. So first is, um, you know, how organizations think about their data science function and kind of their analytics function. As, as, as I mentioned, it's no longer just, you know, the data nerds who are kind of responsible for the data. It's now every kind of department will have some data capabilities that are required within that. And so, organizations are, you know, it's important for them to instill a culture of data within their, within their teams broadly. Mm -hmm. um, you obviously know this, you, you're, you know, host of the data bench podcast, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but kind of a, a uh, another consequence of that is, um, you know, data teams themselves, um, you know, it's important to, uh, for organizations to build teams that are representative of uh, the people that will be using those products and kind of, uh, you know, inclusive and diverse in a way that sometimes the tech field is not. Um, you know, I think data science, as I mentioned, is it's uniquely important for this industry to get the diversity problem right, um, because not only is it going to be a huge part of the economy, um, but the actual product that data scientists produce are decision-making tools. And it's really important for those tools to, to be unbiased, to be fair, to be equitable. And the best way to do that is to have people that are building them be, um, you know, of diverse, you know, representation. Um, and so when we, when we work with organizations, a lot of what we do is, um, you know, we'll help them connect with candidates that, you know, maybe they, you know, we're not the the initial kind of like stereotypical data scientist that um, you know you you might think of when when you're you know thinking of uh, you know like an MIT PhD, um, but are still candidates that have really strong skills in analytics, can be trained, understand the business domain, um, and uh, and can kind of help those organizations build more diverse, inclusive uh, teams. That's that's one. 
thing that I think there's just so much focus on. And, and I, I tend to talk a lot about DNI and I, 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 I am part of the DNI leadership team at Microsoft in our specific uh, enterprise operating unit. And I'm, I'm all over the topic and yeah. I, we're not like, I didn't even like light the pilot for you to talk about these items, but they're important for you and they're important for correlation one. They're important for your customers that are coming in. Um, I had a, a, a woman on not too long ago. Uh, she was a, a, a chief of digital or VP of digital at NPR, Noelle Silver. And mm -hmm. she talked about how expensive it was for you to not only get diverse, the diverse diversity of data sets, like when you're building a product that it's expensive to get data that represents a lot of different feature sets. And yeah. then it's expensive to hire somebody. And then yeah. it's expensive to do market analysis on a customer that typically wouldn't be in your typical horizon of engagement. So it's like super expensive to do all these different things. And then folks are saying, well, I, we don't have anybody in the, in the talent pool. Um, yeah. What is, what is your response to some of those, those items in terms of you guys' process and what you're doing out in the field? Yeah, no. And I think, um, I think it's, it's, you know, a fair statement for, for, uh, you know, um, to make, which is, um, historically, it, it is challenging to build diverse teams when, you know, 70% of data science students that are in a typical PhD program are not diverse, right? And so what we identified the problem was not a demand side problem, right? The demand side problem would be organizations have hiring biases, you know, there, there's challenges there. I'm not saying those don't exist. Obviously, hiring biases exist. That's been proven. Um, but most of the organizations we work with, and I think this is, you know, representative of, of, you know, most kind of organizations that are, you know, leaders in the data science space, they're very proactive about trying to build data science teams. It's, it's hard when the candidate mix is, uh, is not reflective of that. And so what we have tried to do at Correlation One is actually address the supply side issue, right? We mm -hmm. need to train more data science and analytics professionals from underrepresented groups so that organizations can connect with them even more easily. Um, and we actually, so we've, we've deployed what we think is a fairly interesting model, which, um, is we run advanced, you know, almost master's level training programs, several months long. Our, uh, our, our lead professor is a professor from Harvard. Um, but the programs are completely free for participants. And, you know, the way we make money is through corporations who kind of sponsor endowed scholarships for those students. And so ultimately what we aim to do is kind of remove structural barriers for people that you know either are from underrepresented groups which could be racial could be gender could be geographic right yeah rural america other countries you know experience related exactly um and so you know it, it's not just along the racial and gender vectors we work we work with kind of uh, populations from kind of underserved communities um you know geographically as well um and help them kind of uh you know get the opportunities that, uh, you know, historically have been unavailable to them. I, I was uh, having a chat earlier this week with a, a guest that I, I'd like to come on in a couple of weeks. We have something on the schedule. Uh, yeah. Her name is Kendra Crook. She comes from an organization, nonprofit called Management Leadership for Tomorrow. And essentially, they uh, I've talked about it before in past episodes, but they uh, prep underserved populations to enter either MBA, top tier MBA schools or organizations or what have you. And one of the things that she was telling me earlier was, look, like there's so many restrictions and, I, and, I, and this kind of maps back to one of your points you made earlier. There's so many restrictions in how someone from that type of population wouldn't get an opportunity. It's like GPA or GMAT score or, you know, whatever. When sometimes some, one of the things you just have to do is just hire them, just yeah. You just need to hire them. You just need to hire a population. So then he can build on top of that foundation. Um, when you talk about, you know, you're, you're cultivating folks at this master level type of engagement. Um, but you're, you're not looking for people who are, you know, super analytical when they're 12 or 15 right. or they're brilliant. Like, what do you think the importance is Andrew about, just kind of cultivating people that maybe maybe don't aren't the sharpest in those different arenas, but teaching them anyway, skilling them anyway, getting them interested. Yeah, no, and I think um, 
when, when we talk about data literacy, it's often not, um, you know, being a PhD in machine learning. It's, you know, helping people think analytically about whatever their work function is, mm-hmm. um, which, are, which are, you know, schools and t- uh, skills and tools that, that anyone can learn, right? This isn't, this isn't like rocket science. Um, but the other thing that we really try to impart on everyone we work with is that being a good data professional is not knowing the most advanced technique or knowing, uh, you know, the most, uh, uh, the newest, uh, trendiest tool. It's having a curiosity about your business and about the data that that business produces so that you can glean interesting insights. And, you know, we always tell them a, a, you know, an analysis that yields an interesting result, but might not be, you know, an advanced technique um, is always more impactful to a business than some, you know, advanced predictive model that you built that, you know, isn't ultimately relevant to business goals. And so, um, you know, a little bit of a long-winded answer, but point being, when we try to work with candidates and kind of helping them develop the skills and tools they need, it's not so much, you know, here's the master's level course on data science and like all the different, you know, Python languages and packages you need to learn, but more, here's how data science is actually applied in the real world. Here's the types of questions that people are asking when they're using data in their jobs to kind of help them, you know, develop that curious mindset um, that we think is is ultimately what really matters. Yeah. So, so curiosity, it's, it's cool because it's like curiosity, the willingness to learn, I'm sure, you know, yeah. when we come across like younger folks that are like looking up to us to, it's weird to even say that younger folks that are like looking <laughs> to us, to, like mentor them and, you know, just take them under uh, our wing. And it's not that like, I don't, I'm not impressed by how sh- smart someone is or how quickly they can gather their thoughts. It's, hey, how willing are they to learn and how willing, yeah. how curious are they? What kind of questions are they asking? Um, okay. So, now that I understand kind of the construct of how, what you guys are doing. So, you, so let's say you have like a, 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 a customer coming in, client coming in, an organization coming in, um, they have some needs. Um, do they kind of impart on you those needs and then say, look, like this is kind of what we're looking for. Do you consult them in terms of what they should be looking for? Do you host, I, I'm, I'm looking at some, some, you have some data thons and, and AI games and really cool things yeah. going on to really attract these minds. What does that like that, that journey look like just so we can paint a picture of that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and you know, for, for each client, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, but as you, as you pointed out, like ultimately we want to design our programs in a way that benefits our clients, right? You know, we want to kind of help connect them with candidates that are going to be fits for their roles. Um, which in turn is helpful for the candidates because we can then, you know, train them in a way that we know is going to be relevant for our clients. Um, and so, um, specifically in our data science for all programs, what we usually do is we will coordinate with the companies who are sponsoring the program very early to just understand, okay, what are the actual data initiatives that are top of mind for you? Um, and then usually when students are going through our program, they'll work on capstone projects that are actual data initiatives for those organizations. And so, you know, it's almost like a, a micro internship, which is great for both parties because um, the candidates get real world experience. They understand now how to apply what they're learning in finance or technology or e-commerce, what have you. Um, but they're also developing real relationships. They're, you know, working with mentors in those organizations on these projects, um, uh, getting connections that, that, you know, would otherwise be difficult. And for the employers, it's great because they've got people working on real projects for them. They get to understand, you know, how they actually work. And then they're hiring them with, you know, a really high level of confidence. They've seen them actually get their hands dirty on some real data that that's kind of relevant to their organization. So you, you kind of liaise between academia uh, and then these organizations that are looking for this type of person. Yeah, exactly. And we, I mean, we partner with uh, most of, you know, the top, top universities. Um, you know, we've got great partnerships with a number of, uh, you know, data science and computer science departments. Um, uh, but um, what we really aim to do is, you know, I often say, we're not here to teach you the science of linear modeling. We'll teach you how Zillow uses linear modeling to predict home prices or how, you know, uh, hedge fund uses linear modeling to build a trading strategy, right? And that's, you know, a, a crude example. But um, our aim is to really kind of, uh, you know, help people understand how data science is actually applied in the real world, 
help them kind of develop the skills that they need to, to be meaningful uh, uh, members of, of whatever organization they choose to work for. And, and that's really, I, I like the micro consulting, you know, projects. I mean, there was some, there was some opportunity for that um, at McCombs uh, business yeah. school. And I, I did a project with strategy and, and at the time it was like grueling kind of more work on top of your work, but there was, such an it was such an amazing experience, a personal experience from just kind of going in working on. I think it might have been you know a ten or twelve week project. Um, you had partners in the organization that were super. When we saw how invested the partners and senior staff was, senior associates of of Strategy N, when we were kind of working with them on this thing, yeah, we we find we grasped like how important it was for us. Um, and I think just kind of being next to some of those initiatives and working on real stuff versus just kind of just working on something that has no, no meaning, I think is really important. Um, so yeah. yeah. And I think, uh, I mean, you know, you probably learned a lot more about strategy and through that exercise than you yes. would have you've gone to like a career fair uh, info session of, of strategy. And right. You learned what problems they actually think through what um, their organizational culture is like. And we found that those kind of micro projects are, are nice because it's a lower commitment than, you know, being like a full-time summer intern, right? You don't, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, but it still kind of helps foster connections between companies and candidates in a meaningful way. Yeah. I mean, every little piece, now I'm thinking back on it and, you know, I came from, I had, I had a career before the MBA, so I kind of knew how to ha have a job in the, in corporate America, mm -hmm. but little yeah. things like, you know, just the way that you dress and the way that you handle yourself. And we'd get on coaching calls and these folks would like literally be coaching us in how to handle these problems. And it was cool to just listen in and actually understand and learn in real time on a real problem. So uh, to your point, yeah, so much better than a career fair, both sides kind of understand what's going to happen. Um, I think Gary Vaynerchuk is like one of my heroes. I've, I've said this a million times on this podcast, but one of the things he, talks about when it comes to hiring is when you're hiring, it's like guessing. And when you're firing, it's like knowing. And it's and really tough to understand who you're hiring and, and things that they're doing ahead of time, um, especially when they're getting referred by someone that you know in your pipeline. Um, so when you, when you think about some of your, your, your clients, um, can you describe some of them, either if if you can if you can talk about them publicly or talk about you know sample clients that are doing this really well, they're just super good at hiring. Yeah. Um, so when we started, so we were based in New York. Um, a lot of our company or a lot of our uh, um, kind of founding team had uh, kind of strong finance experience, and so a lot of the early companies we worked with are uh, you know quantitative hedge funds, and, and these are you know the smartest people in the room and in almost every room. Um, and what I think they do really well, more than any other type of organization I've worked with is on the hiring side, right? And I hadn't heard that quote before, but I think it's uh, so spot on. Hiring's guessing, firing's knowing, I, I really like that. Um, but you know, another quote that we've heard from some of the hedge funds we work with is, you know, the, the business model of a hedge fund is simple. The input is people, the output is money. Um, but, but getting the right people for them is the hardest problem in the world, right? If they're able to find the right people, um, uh, then they're, then they're usually successful. Um, and so when we have worked with hedge funds and I'll, I'll give you an example, um, you know, the kind of largest public relationship we have is, is with a hedge fund called Citadel. They're one of the you know largest, most successful hedge funds in the world. When we started working with them, we designed a program called the data open. And the data open is a series of data science competitions um, called data thons that we host at basically every top school all around the world each year. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of this program is, you know, multifaceted. They obviously want to develop their brand in the university space. They want to connect with candidates, but also they want to put all their candidates through a talent audition, you know, and, and Oftentimes, uh, um, you know, one of their old talent strategists would liken it to an NFL combine where it's absurd to think of a new draft pick coming in and, you know, asking a question of how would you run the 40 yard dash, right? Instead, you would just have him run a 40 yard dash and see how fast he is or have him do the shuttle yeah. run. Um, but in most businesses, you know, you're not actually put through a simulation. You go in through an interview and talk about what you might do on the job. 
um, which isn't the best way to uh, uh, kind of assess someone's actual skill. And so we designed this whole idea of a talent audition for them, where we would put people through a real world simulation of, okay, here's a scenario where you actually have to work with data, you're working with the team, you're working in a high stress environment. Um, and you know, we capture all sorts of data points on people through that process. Um, and for Citadel, it's incredibly valuable because they get to see how people are able to work together in a team, um, you know, what, uh, what decisions they prioritize in a short, condensed competition time, time frame. Um, and, uh, you know, for them, you know, the value is immense because now they just have so many more data points to make that higher with, with more confidence. Um, so that's how we did that with Citadel. Um, it, it actually, uh, the program got featured in a Harvard Business School case study, which was super cool for us. Yeah. Um, kind of like talent auditions. Um, and it's kind of what we've tried to replicate with our data science for all program with these kind of micro project internships where, um, you know, it's not just making a guess on someone's resume, but let me work with them on a real project for a short time and kind of learn how they work. And then, you know, I'll just get to know them better and hire with a little more confidence. So, uh, I mean, I'll just be absolutely clear, like the idea of me going into um, uh, uh, the data open is absolutely terrifying. It sounds horrible. <laughs> like, data, high stress environment, like, you know, smartest people in, in the, all of that sounds absolutely terrible. Um, but it, it, it sounds like a really awesome, I mean, that's an, an amazing way. It's almost like what management consultants tend to do with their hiring, right? Of like giving these cases and having people solve these cases on the fly or having to do, um, again, uh, this, uh, the VP of, of digital from NPR, when she, when she was on, she was talking about how, when she interviews folks, like, she's not like, Hey, let me co let me look over your shoulder while you, co while you code. Cause that's just a terrible thing to do, but how are they approaching the problem? Like, yeah. you know, it goes back to the curiosity, like you said, like working as this cohesive team. So these businesses are, are looking for data and these data literate folks in this, in this specific way. Um, so that's, so that's, an, that's an amazing way of how that's working. What's one of the, what's one of the best examples of a bad process that's come in, um, where they had a current process and you, your team looked at it and fixed it. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, one thing that we try to share with all of our clients is that only limiting your search to top schools, particularly, um, but also, you know, only candidates with a certain GPA cutoff is a little yeah. bit self defeating. Um, and the way that I often try to explain that is, you know, if you are going to Harvard and recruiting at Harvard, you're recruiting against every other company who's recruiting at Harvard. So the deck, the deck is kind of stacked against you as an employer to try to get the best person at Harvard. In reality, you're probably going to get, you know, a middle of the road person, you know, recruit from Harvard just because it's so challenging to recruit from that pool of candidates. Mm -hmm. In contrast, if you're able to go to, you know, a tier two, tier three school, the likelihood that a kind of a top candidate from that school is going to be better than an average candidate from Harvard is, is just kind of like the law of distributions, right? You know, the average candidate at a, you know, Southwestern state type of school is certainly going to be worse than the average candidate at Harvard, but the best candidate at those schools is definitely going to be better than the average candidate at Harvard. And the, the thing is that the best candidates in a lot of these kind of overlooked markets um, are, are just where the real untapped value is. And so when we try to work with companies, we try to help them think of thoughtful ways to actually tap into kind of those broader candidate pools, um, you know, without, uh, uh, you know, um, kind of uh, blowing off our resources. And so um, as an example, like our, our data science for all program is meant to do the, just that. It's a, it's a virtual training program. It's for uh, students from, you know, across the United States and Europe. Um, you know, we even run programs in like South America. Um, and what we're hoping to do is, you know, help employers find those kind of proverbial needles in the haystack that are really where a lot of the talent advantage lies um, versus just going to the same top schools that everyone else is going to. I, when I was kind of taking a look at Correlation One, um, I, one of your, your your landing pages kind of featured this data thon or hackathon in Bogota, Colombia. Yeah. 
which I yeah. thought was really cool. And I, and I, I had a short stint memory, not to, not to cover in depth my, my trips to Columbia, but uh, <laughs> spent some time in Bogota and there in the hills of Bogota, there's this amazing restaurant called Co uh, Cochne de Reyes. And yeah. it is amazing. It's like this steakhouse and it's like this Willy Wonka factory ish steakhouse meets Tim Burton, like crazy place. Um, yeah. Just a little, little offshoot memory from uh, some of the, the, the stuff I had, I saw on your website. So, yeah, no, and, and sorry to, to just jump in, but one, one kind of additional point that I think is interesting is COVID has obviously kind of changed everything in, in a lot of different ways, but, um, you know, one meaningful way that I think has not yet materialized is employers, you know, they're now letting remote work be a little bit of a new normal. Right. A lot of companies have says, said we're going to be remote forever. A kind of downstream implication of that that I don't think a lot of companies have really grasped yet is that, you know, if you're Twitter and you're used to hiring engineers in San Francisco, you're used to paying a salary that is required to live in San Francisco. Right. But in a all remote world, you don't have to only hire engineers in San Francisco. You can hire engineers in other geographies that you know, are oftentimes just as good. Um, but the cost of living there is significantly cheaper. And so it's, it's kind of a real advantage that I think some employers are going to start taking advantage of, which is, um, you know, you think of the, the best data scientists in Colombia. um, you know, the local economy of Colombia is just, you know, the, the salary expectations are not what they are for the best data scientists in San Francisco. And so there's, I think a real opportunity for companies to kind of take advantage of that. And when you think, so we're, we're kind of tapping into this reality of COVID and uh, we have a comment uh, that just came in from Thomas Duclos. He says that they have a sister office in Medellin. Uh, that's pretty, pretty quiet. I, that, that was a pretty neat city. That city is a lot like Chicago, um, uh, like in the way that it's kind of built up and formed. It's a beautiful city, especially, you know, two, three decades after Narcos. <laughs> um, but when, when you think about um, COVID and you think about the way that, education is looking at this point. Um, and Microsoft, they just kind of released this, um, this initiative, the, the Microsoft Global Skills Initiative, where they plan on skilling up to 25 million people globally for free, just because they're understanding, you know, especially um, uh, unemployment is hitting certain underserved populations harder. Um, yep. Hispan Hispanic, Latinx, Black, African American, almost five to 6% more than their Caucasian peers. And then women are, are being hit dis disproportionately, almost almost two to 3% more than men. So there's this idea of folks losing their jobs and not being able to, you know, be frontline Warner workers not being able to, to skill up. What do you think the implications are on COVID in terms of the pipeline of skill that you're going to be working with in the next 12 to 24 months based upon, you know, some of these different metrics. Yeah. Um, and by pipeline, you're talking about kind of the, the actual candidates that are. Yeah. Our yeah. 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 So, you know, I, obviously there's been millions of people put out of work by COVID. Right. And, and, you know, we've even seen in our programs, just the demand for what we're doing in terms of training and upskilling and, and kind of helping people connect with jobs um, has increased significantly since since the beginning of the year. And so, um, you know, what we really want to make sure that we do is we train people for the jobs that are actually relevant and realistic. And so, you know, part of the our, our initiative that we're doing in the fall, our Data Science for All program, you know, not everyone's going to be a data scientist, right? Not everyone's going to be a, a PhD and kind of need those skills. You know, there's also just significantly less data scientist jobs that firms are hiring for versus data analyst jobs or sales analyst or marketing analyst. And so what we really aim to do is help people be data literate, you know, help people particularly from, from kind of uh, communities that have been hit hardest be, be data literate um, because, uh, um, you know, we think that, um, data literacy is is the most important skill um, for for jobs in the future. Um, does that does that answer your question? It, it does. So so it that answers it well because instead of focusing kind of on um, like the the depth 
um, or like the marginal data science uh, need, you're really focusing on maybe some of that when you're working on some of these hedge fund type uh, organizations yeah. that needs really, really bright people in specific areas. But you're kind of yeah. addressing this long tail of, um, of people that just need to learn how to operate in these new tools, whether it's like a, a Tableau, a Power BI, visualization, being able to, to you know, diagnostic and anal analyses versus, you know, getting into predictive and building models, but just being able to look at this stuff and make decisions with it. Yeah. And, and, and as you mentioned, like it's, you know, most of the people aren't going to be hired as data scientists. You know, they might be customer service representatives who are using analytical tools in their jobs. But we know based on, you know, our relationships with employers and just, you know, general economic trends that data analysis skills are just going to be important for every job. And so we think enabling kind of the workforce with that baseline level of skill um, is just kind of horizontally applicable. And what do you think, I guess, when you're thinking about graduates or, you know, I, I don't want to call them young people, but let's call them young people. You know, people sure. 18, you know, early, 18, early career professionals. Yeah, yeah. There you go. That sounds, that's a lot better for my ego. <laughs> so uh, when you're, when you're thinking about those types of folks, um, what are some things that they should be thinking about if they want to get just an awesome job? They're really fresh. They, they, they want to do the best that they can to prepare for some of these different organizations. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the, there's a couple skills that we really try to hone in on. I already mentioned kind of the curiosity element, right? And, and like you know, more than knowing the tools and knowing the skills, being curious about the organizations that you're working with, being curious about the problems you're trying to solve will ultimately make you better, you know, regardless of whether you're a data scientist, you know, in any job, I think that's relevant. Um, and so that's, that's kind of a core learning aptitude skill that we try to um, impart with all the, the early career folks we work with. Um, the kind of flip side of that coin is being a good data storyteller. Being able to communicate insights effectively is extremely important. And, and I'm sure you know this well, um, you know, working with, with Microsoft's AI organization, um, that's where a lot of organizations really struggle. They'll have the data team, they'll have the business team, and they're speaking different languages. And you know, organizations have even started introducing roles called like data translators, which are supposed to help the business team understand what the data science team is doing and kind of yeah. bridge that. Um, but uh, you know, regardless of of what team you work on, being able to communicate data insights. Um, is extremely important, especially for early career people. And so a lot of the work that we do with our students is helping them uh, with their first projects, building their portfolios, communicating them in a meaningful way. And, you know, a lot of times that's just like basic PowerPoint type skills, but, but helping them kind of understand the key insights that a business executive might care about and communicating kind of those insights to, to the person on their terms. I, I really, really like this this kind of track where you're talking about data storytelling, um, data translation. I mean, that's, yeah. that's essentially what I do. Like I'm not a PhD data scientist, uh, yeah. and, and I'm not building the models. I'm not cultivating them, but I understand what our, our partners and our customers need at the executive level. And my job is to essentially come in, take a look at, at some of these, these models. And I mean, these statements that these, these folks are creating, um, you know, the, the business doesn't care about the, the number of GPUs it took um, right. to, to, you know, to, to, to look at a bunch of forms and recognize forms and then turn it into the metadata. Um, and I don't, it, that's a skill gap, Andrew, that I'm seeing everywhere. Like when we call a, a bad meeting for us is when there's a very, very, it, it's an, an executive uh, demonstration or, or meeting. And there's a very, very nuanced technical kind of topic and they come on and and the team that's kind of producing the topic pitches this to the team that's listening and mm -hmm. they're just like crickets yeah. and everyone on the call is like oh my god they're going into like in, into in an insane like like very 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 deep into which models they chose why they chose the models the feature sets all these different things and it just doesn't land and and a lot of people are confused um 
so I, I really, I really now understand like that power you're, you're, you're getting people to be data literate. They're then data literate. And now they can just make sense of these types of conversations and they can just make them the conversations better. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's obviously challenges there within like a true hardcore, like data science research or communicating mm -hmm. to the business org, like that kind of like org to org challenges. But yeah. for early career analysts that we work with that, you know, may not be data scientists, maybe they're coming on as a, you know, strategy analyst to help out with the sales function, right? They still need to be good data storytellers because, you know, they might need to explain to the sales executives, hey, here's what we're seeing in your pipeline. Here's the trends. Here's kind of, uh, you know, what segments are having better close rates, uh, you know, what, what kind of uh, uh, marketing campaigns are generating better pipeline. Um, there's still kind of relevant data analyses that's taking place, you know, across the organization that usually the kind of early career analysts are, are responsible for producing. And so helping them be good data storytellers is equally important as helping, you know, the hardcore PhD data scientists be good data storytellers. Yeah. When you think about, so, so we got some great, I think, pieces for early in career folks that want to build that muscle. Um, mm -hmm. So going back to some of these businesses, you know, who, who may not be hedge funds, who, who work with Correlation One, may not be the Microsofts and Googles and Neuros and all these amazing, you know, unicorns that, you, that are just hiring up talent all over the place. Yeah. If you are just, you know, a, a manufacturer or a CPG company, um, a smaller business, like what are, what's some advice for building that muscle and tapping into some of that talent? Yeah, um, for them, you know, we, we obviously work with those organizations um, to help them identify and access new talent that we think would be great for them. Um, but we also strongly recommend for those organizations to continue to invest in their own people. And, and the reasons for that are, are multiple. First, um, you know, it's, it's a lot cheaper to train someone who's already on your team uh, with, with kind of data skills than to go out and hire a data scientist where we know data scientists are, are expensive for most employers. Um, but kind of a more fundamental point is that data science success is, you know, and this kind of goes back to many points that I've talked about, but data science success is a combination of skill and domain knowledge and the domain knowledge comes from, you know, being curious and, and all the stuff I talked about. But, you know, if you have people that have been working or in your organization for years, they know your domain better, far better than any new PhD data scientist off the market that you could hire. Um, and so when we work with those organizations, um, usually our first recommendation is, okay, you know, you have kind of career professionals who've been in this organization who know your business better than anyone. Let's equip them with the practical data skills that they need for their job so that they can start to, you know, develop the right insights and, and kind of push your business forward. That's super relevant. Um, yeah. So skilling, I think, and just kind of pulling up uh, uh, some statistics from the Department of, um, of Labor. Uh, as a percentage in terms of employees that were getting employer paid training. Uh, in 1996, it was about 19.4% U.S. employees getting um, employer-paid training. So almost 20%, um, not too bad. In 2008, yeah. that dropped down to 11.2%. And mm. that's dropping increasingly with employers wanting to put money into, into their, own, their own internal funnel. Do you see that being a problem? And... Do some of the companies that you're working with, do they have training programs? Do you see a deficit in the way that they're approaching this? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, I think we see frequently companies have training programs for, you know, new analysts, right? Like, you know, the big consultant firms, the big banks, um, you know, you, you join straight out of college, you're in a training program, you understand, you know, how to build a financial model or, or what have you. Um, what we don't see enough of um, are kind of thoughtful upskilling programs for more experienced professionals. Um, and what we, what we recommend there, where I think kind of a, a deficit often lies is, you know, some organizations might say, oh, well, we got you an account to this, uh, you know, online uh, uh, kind of massive open online course training platform, like go learn data science, right? 
um, which, yeah, it's so which, hard. which is great. You've got like the, you know, um, the world at your fingertips. Um, but the data shows that most people that kind of participate in self-directed classes, they'll get through like one or two uh, lectures and they'll drop off. And, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I've, I've definitely tried to jump into the Coursera's and Udemy's and like, Me too. Had, uh, had, you know, like it's usually, okay, I'll spend a weekend on this and then I'll get back to it later. Um, and so what we really try to work with companies is to make the training as practical as possible. Um, our training is first, you know, it's, it's an online training, but it's um, live in the sense that there's live lectures, there's TAs that are helping you through the program. Um, and everything we teach is around real business cases, you know, and so when we're working with an insurance agency, it might be a case around, you know, here's how, uh, you know, you can use FICO scores to better predict uh, credit default or, or, or what have you, um, and kind of building models around that so that the training isn't just abstract, but it's actually practical and tangible so that what they're learning on the training, they actually apply to their jobs. Um, and so that's where we see the biggest gap is just that, you know, well-intentioned employers are saying, okay, great. There's all these new training tools out there. We'll give people subscriptions to them and they can go learn. But unless they're kind of actively facilitating the learning and making sure that it's relevant to their organization, um, you know, it usually just doesn't end up uh, kind of having the follow through that they hope to win. I, you know, I'm so glad that someone like you, as brilliant as you are, have the same exact um, uh, inequities <laughs> when, it go, when it comes to try, like taking these online courses. I don't know how many, I think signing up for like a free course is almost like, or even paying a little bit of money for a free course, a, a very small amount, marginal amount, is almost like buying supplements or like some vitamin that's supposed to be really good. For, like the process of doing that makes you feel so superior and yeah. then and then you just don't do it. Like, yeah. like you'll be like, you know, you'll just go and then you'll, you'll crush beers and, and pizza or, you know, not do work rather than focus on the learning. And it just kind of goes to waste. And that's a terrible problem. Um, one of the things that I think Microsoft has done well, and I don't know how it is at, at, in, or, in other organizations at AWS and, and Google, I'm sure it's fantastic, but we have something MS Learn. And I think MS Learn is free to anyone who has a, a Microsoft um, account, right? And you can choose certifications based upon your need. And some of the certifications cost a little bit of money. I think it's for specifically anchored into enterprise, like big enterprises. But most yeah. are free, you get like these badges that you get. And it's really yeah. cool because you can choose some like focus point. So I, I did a, a data engineering certificate, data engineering associate certificate. I don't know anything about data engineering. I do now because I took this course and I mean, the, it was probably 100, 200 hours of studying. It was pretty gnarly. But you sign into this thing and you get modules. And then along with the module, this is the best part, yeah. is a lab. So it'll give you like some, some you know, a passage of something. It'll explain what's going on. I have a start button. So it'll actually um, spin up a virtual machine in the cloud that's sandboxed and that's absolutely free. So you're actually able to log into the cloud portal and actually turn on some virtual machines and ingest some data and like run some models against the data and actually see it work in real time. And I was I didn't really believe in it at first because you're just kind of going through these modules, but at the end of each module and at the end of each lab, I was actually smarter and knew what I was doing. And it, it's really enhanced my learning. So I, that, that's just a personal experience of of how these kind of labs and like real use cases can help folks. Yeah, I think they have to be interactive. Like if it's just, you know, watch this lecture um, and then skip to the next one, like, um, you know, passive learning is just, you know, unless you're engaged, it's just hard to have something really sink in. So, so that's great. Um, and I think, you know, for something like MS Learn, like what, what we see often is companies will say, okay, you, you know, you have a lynda.com account, now go have fun. But um, it's important for the managers to help them navigate that. There's so much education resources online now um, that, it, you know, if you're just kind of unleashed to the wild west of like go on lynda.com and pick your own course, um, it's, it's challenging for people. And so, um, you know, you obviously have enough uh, kind of guidance to know what would be relevant for you to go learn. So, you know, the data engineering course, you know, probably relevant for, for the work you do with clients. Um, 
a lot of people need that guidance from from their organization for them from their manager to help them navigate all the resources that are available for training now and and I absolutely agreed. I think one of the things, and before I go on, Iasia Brown, um, she's on, uh, she's a Microsoft uh, colleague of mine. Um, she ma uh, made a comment. It appears they give courses with no context or accountability to use or finish it. So you know, accountability, I think, is a is a big component of that. Maybe making them really expensive and calling it an <laughs> MBA program <laughs> might give you a little bit of accountability to finish up. But thanks for that comment, uh, Iasia. Um, so lastly, um, wanted to talk about like what what's in your future? Like what are you excited about? Um, and it could be um, aligned with the correlation one. It could be things you're personally excited about and, and some of the impact that you're seeing. Um, what goes through your head? What really, really gets you to start having fun? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't want to retread kind of conversation territory that we've already talked about, but I I am really excited about just kind of people taking a hard look at higher education models um, mm -hmm. and thinking through like, what is the actual value that we're trying to get out of them? And I think like, you know, we're in a unique time now where there's lots of things that are now on the table in terms of let's revisit kind of the old ways that things were done and like, you know, think through new models. Um, and so um, we are obviously a new model for education and that, um, you know, it's a, intensive boot camp like experience where we're not charging tuition for students. Um, and, and, you know, we think that um, students are just going to be reevaluating whether paying 50 grand, 70 grand a year for a higher education program, um, you know, is the right model going forward. We think companies are going to be reevaluating how they are accessing talent, whether it's, you know, going to just the top schools or if there's kind of more thoughtful ways to um, build their teams. Um, and so it's a, it's a unique time where, you know, people are just reevaluating kind of commonly held um, uh, um, kind of truths um, or perceived truths. Um, and, uh, and I think it's going to be exciting to see how it all shakes out. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think that's a paradigm. You know, I got in, into tremendous, tremendous student loan debt, both with my undergrad and my, and my graduate degree. Yeah. And like, you know, I think folks like us, like that's why, that's why Bernie's our boy, you know, like that's why those types of ide ideologies around maybe not, you know, having government fund, fund these different things. And we're not going to get political, but in, a new model needs to be had. A new education model needs to be had. And it can't, it can't limit the people that can access that because of their web access or because of where they live or who they are or who their parents are or aren't. And I'm just really excited that your people like you are passionate about these different things because we need really bright people working on these problems. Um, and then I got one more question for you. And this one is one I ask of all my guests. If you had seven days, seven days, and you had unlimited resources, what, okay. would, you, what would you work on? What would I work on with unlimited resources? Oh, for seven um, days. You, you, you can't, you probably can't launch. Uh, you probably can't go to the moon unless you're super tight with Elon Musk and you email him right now. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and this isn't seven days to live. It's just, I have seven days to use unlimited resources. Um, I'm taking some time. So I want to, want to have a good answer. Hmm. It doesn't even have to be good. I mean, yeah, I think, you know, you, you mentioned earlier how you and I were both kind of in the clean tech group at, at McCombs. And I, 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 you know, for most of my time at McCombs, I was pretty gung ho on trying to work in that industry. What was challenging was that um, most of the big companies that, that I was uh, interested in were going bankrupt, right? <laughs> the, economics, <laughs> the economics of that industry just haven't really Not proven good. It. Yeah. Um, and so uh, um, I think, you know, with unlimited resources, I would try to make solar um, energy just a, a standard across, uh, um, you know, every geography. Um, and and I, I the mechanics of how I do that in seven days, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Um, <laughs> I'm focusing my energy on, on one problem. 
um, it would probably be kind of a climate related issues. That's awesome. Uh, so Andrew, um, how can folks get a hold of you? If they'd like to learn more about Correlation One or just connect with you. Yeah, um, so anyone can go to our website, correlation1.com, um, kind of all spelled out. Um, you know, I mentioned the programs we're running this fall. We have two programs uh, kind of under our Data Science for All um, series, uh, one specifically focused on kind of young women candidates, one specifically focused on kind of underrepresented uh, people of color and LGBT. Um, both of those programs are completely free and we're kind of building the classes right now. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, um, would love uh, um, to kind of just share the word about that. Um, and then, uh, you know, people, uh, I'll, I'll kind of uh, use LinkedIn as my channel since we're promoting this on LinkedIn. Um, anyone that wants to connect with me on LinkedIn, I'm, I'm pretty active on that. So uh, drop me a friend request, drop me a note, and uh, we'll have to chat. That's awesome. Well, Andrew, this was really fun. It's cool to, to, to kind of think about uh, me struggling with corporate finance and, and you taking laps around the school and probably getting a better grade than I did and uh, and seeing you again and just watching your work I think you know it's really cool to see people like you focus on on these types of endeavors so um, thanks for joining the podcast today yeah thanks for having me on I'm, I'm uh, you know a big fan of the data bench podcast and uh, you know always uh, excited to, to chat with you bud <laughs> all right thanks Andrew talk to you soon right. see you Derek